While most of the stories recently out of South Africa have detailed new efforts by the government to silence its internal critics, there are many South African exiles who continue to find ways to speak out against the country's rigid segregation laws. Our final focus tonight is a look at one of South Africa's most unusual voices in exile. It is Charlene hunter gods story. They call her Mama Africa, the empress of South African song. One of the most powerful voices ever to be heard out of South Africa's black townships. In the beginning, back in the early 50s, they called her the nut brown baby. A young unknown from Mufulo village, singing mostly for free. But within a decade, the voice of Miriam Makeba would be heard around the world. Not only as Africa's first international singing success, but increasingly as one of the most prominent critics of her country's rigid segregation laws known as apartheid. In 1960, Makeba's mother died. When she attempted to return home for the funeral, the South African government stamped her passport invalid. For the next 28 years, Makeba would be a unique exile, outlawed at home, but welcomed everywhere else, especially by African leaders like Kenyan President Jomo Kenyatta, Mozambique's Samora Michel, Many sent for her to sing as their countries gained the independence still denied the black majority in South Africa. Guinean President Sekou Touré thrust her onto the world political stage as an adopted Guinean and delegate to the United Nations. In apparent retaliation for her anti-apartheid speeches at the UN, South Africa banned her records. Still, Makeba enjoyed unprecedented success around the world until 1968, when she married her fourth husband, American student leader and black power activist, Stokely Carmichael. In her new autobiography, Makeba, My Story, Makeba recalls getting the news from her manager. My concerts are being canceled left and right. I learn that people are afraid that my shows will finance radical activities. It is frightening this wonderful dream come true, the little African girl who becomes a big star in America, it's all over. And so it was, a new kind of exile. For 19 years, Makeba made her home in Guinea and was not to be seen on stage again in America until 1987, when she returned with Paul Simon's Graceland tour. Joseph's face was black as night The pale yellow moon shone in his eyes Thanks to the tour, Makeba, now 56, has just released her first U.S. album in 19 years, Sangoma, a collection of traditional South African songs. I spoke with Miriam Makeba recently about her life as South Africa's most famous exile. She began her answer with an excerpt from her new book. I look at an ant and I see myself, a native South African endowed by nature with a strength much greater than my size so I might cope with the weight of a racism that crushes my spirit. I look at a bird and I see myself, a native South African, soaring above the injustices of apartheid on wings of pride, the pride of a beautiful people. I look at a stream and I see myself, a native South African, flowing irresistibly over the obstacles until they become smooth and one day disappear flowing from the origin that has been forgotten towards an end that will never be. That's lovely. 
Is that what it's like being South Africa's most famous exile? <laughs> I don't know um, what to say about being South Africa's most famous exile. I think that when you're in exile, you're in exile. Whether, whether famous or not, exile is painful. One of the things you describe in the book is how your daughter, in effect, lost her mind in exile. Tell me about that. Yes, I find it very difficult to talk about my daughter because it's like yesterday. But the thing is, we in, in Africa in general, but South Africa in particular, have a, an extended family. When I leave home, I leave my child. She has my mother, the grandmothers, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins. And uh, by ages, if you are 12, you take care of the one who's five and down the line. So a child is never left alone and abandoned. And in a way, I sometimes regret that I had to bring my daughter here because I took her from that kind of society to bring her into a society where uh, there's individualism. Here, you get married, you go live with your husband, you have your children, and that's your family. And that it, your family ends right there. But our family is a large family. And my daughter was here, and I had to travel to work and earn money for us to live. I can sing in one city or in one country. And I left her, and she did not have that cushion to fall on when I was away. What other sacrifices do you feel you've made as a result of being in exile? The first sacrifice is not being able to go home to my country where, where, I, have, where I was born. And uh, to not see the grave where my mother was laid to rest is very painful. And to see also all the children and people who have come out of South Africa since the 60s, and then such a big, another big exodus in 76 after the Soweto uprising. And to see them now and coming out and being helpless, and some of us also being helpless in helping them, that's also very painful. Is there anything that makes it easier? Any consolations? Just my song. I'm very happy when I sing. Even when I sing a sad song, I'm happy because I, 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 um, I just, it just, it just soothes everything. So my song is my happiness. You talked about your mother who possessed these special powers. And in fact, when you were leaving South Africa, she said that you would never come back again. Tell me about those special powers and about that prophecy. She could um, communicate between us and those who have left us and some power which not everyone has in South Africa. But we have many Sangomas which my mother was one of. Sangomas. Yeah. And those are our traditional healers. And there are songs which we sing to help them get into their concentration and be able to see what is ailing someone and what herbs and or whatever medicine, traditional medicine they can use to cure those ailments. She was one of those. And the songs I sing in my album, Sangoma, which I just recorded, most of them, 70%, are the songs of the Sangomas. And I'm happy that I recorded this album because it just makes me feel that much closer to my mother and to that which we believe. I know that it's very difficult for Westerners to believe that because when a people becomes colonized, 
the first thing they do is to strip you of your own culture and impose that of their own to be able to manipulate you much better. But you had a very mischievous way of dealing with the authorities and where they had no idea what you were singing about. We were not allowed to sing in English. We didn't care because we sang in our own languages. And there were songs we sang that were very detrimental to them. They didn't understand until some of us, because in every revolution in every country, you always find someone within the oppressed to collaborate with the oppressor. Some people, when told them, watch these people, because they are um, you know, arousing the consciousness of the people in that they are singing this and that songs, song, which means this and that, and then those songs were banned. I have to tell you that the first time I ever heard you, I had just gotten out of high school in the early 60s, and you were talking about your native village. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. In my native village near Johannesburg, which, in fact, the village is near Johannesburg. And you, that village was Mufolo, which is today Soweto. And you also said that everybody, you call it the click song because... They cannot say, I had to hear you say that. <laughs> I, I read in the South African newspaper that they recently had a revival of your songs, the, just the second time in the whole 28 years you've been gone that they've allowed your songs to be played. And the people were so excited that it started to rain just as the concert began. And even when the musicians took refuge, the people wouldn't leave. Does that make your exile easier or harder? It makes me happy in that uh, all these years that they've tried to separate me f from my home and from the people at home, it seems as though the people at home have never forgotten me as well as I have never forgotten them, and which make, means that blood is thicker than mud and there's nothing that can come between us. I'm also happy that the people at home have decided uh, that they are not going to sit down and take apartheid just lying down. They say no, and which is why there is such interest today in South Africa. It doesn't come from me, from anyone out here. It comes from the people from within. And I am saying thank you to my people, because that means that we will get there, and I shall go home. <laughs>